just minutes afterwards, so make your questions count. Uh, you only get, hopefully you'll only get one really smart question, and if you ask it, yeah, that's it. Uh, my name is Peter Meissen. I'm the director here at the Sim Center. Uh, some of you here for the very first time, I think. A couple people for the first time, or is everybody regular? All right, good. So we're, we've all been here before. Just real quickly, our, our goal here is to visualize sustainable solutions. So with these screens all the way around, we think it's a better way to tell a story so you can understand the, the history of an issue. How did we, how did we how, where were we and how did we get to where we are today to then see the future of where we're headed a little bit more clearly so you can make better decisions quicker with some cost, cost comparisons. Um, the idea is to ultimately visualize sustainable solutions to both global and local problems so we make smarter decisions quicker. So that's the, that's the mission of this place. Uh, tonight is our partnership with the San Diego Renewable Energy Society. Our director for the 100% Renewable Initiative is Briony. So, tell me your last name again, Briony. What's the last? Fontel. Fontel. From Amsterdam. Uh, the Netherlands. So she is helping us to coordinate this 100% Renewable San Diego Initiative, uh, which is a partnership with SDRES and three organizations, Equinox, the Climate Action Campaign, and the U.S. Green Chamber. Uh, we had Todd Gloria in here several months ago where the city has made that pledge for the city to be 100% renewable. Then, and actually four cities are already 100% renewable in the city of San Di or in the state of California, so it can be done. Uh, our city is at 8%, our utility is at 33%, we have another 4% on the rooftop, so we're in that direction, but 100% is a big lift still to go. Uh, so our partnership with uh, them and, and led by Bryony is to accelerate that process. The city said by 2035, if other cities are already there in California, how do we bring that date a little bit closer for our city and our county? We'd love the city and the county to actually make that stand and, and get there quicker uh, because it is doable and makes and, and ultimately makes economics and, and environmental sense. Um, we actually also have a number of our students that have arrived uh, that are around the room for our summer program. We do a summer program here, uh, our global classroom series called GeoDesign this summer. Ron is helping us coordinate that and we have a number of students that are participating. Renan from Brazil, uh, actually most of them in here from Brazil, like Pedro from Brazil, Leticia, I know, also from Brazil, and there's others that still aren't here tonight, but, uh, oh yeah, you're gonna, or Dan is also a volunteer on another project that he's doing research on, the California water problem. So that's what he's tackling as, as his project. Uh, the rest of you are either members or members of the Renewable Energy Society. If you wanna join us, we would love to have you do that tonight. So tonight we have, I think, an outstanding set of speakers on this discussion around electric vehicles and why your next car should be an electric vehicle. Uh, one of our gentlemen here, Petter Norby, I saw a presentation he did about a year ago over at one of the solar companies, and it was so convincing, I am clear, the next, my next car is an EV, I'm probably in the market in a couple months. I think many of you, after you hear this tonight, will make that same decision, at least I I'll have you, I think you'll consider making that same decision. So I'm glad that Petter is here. He's in the Planning Commission. Their bios are all up here. Colin works with the Center for Sustainable Energy, is their transportation program manager, also an alumnus at UCSD, so no better university than UCSD Tritons. Uh, um, a long, long time ago. Uh, has done work with Sandeg on their readiness plan for this EV uptake. Uh, you'll see in some of these graphs uh, look at this growth curve for electric vehicles in the last, just in the last five years around the United States. What was essentially zero five years ago is now up to, I think it's about a quarter of a million vehicles on the road out there right now and obviously going north. So that's an exciting one. We have a, a graph here that compares right here in California and in San Diego. That's, our, that's not an actual energy mix because it still has nuclear in there. But the CO2 emissions, comparing a gas vehicle down to an EV, uh, even if you're plugging in an EV at night which uses some petroleum, there's a lot less CO2 coming out. A cost comparison between electric and gasoline there. You're going to see some of these slides in part of these presentations. I wanted to give you context. Here's how many are sold out there. Clearly the LEAF and the Tesla are leading the pack in terms of sales. So those are the ones that are making the grade. Uh, this is what your house may look like, isn't it, Petter, right over there? 
I know what that looks like. I know that house. That is your house. Is it? All right, Tom. And then this, this distributed generation, this distributed utility, I think is it's what's giving headaches to SDG&E and &E any utility of the future. Um, Kevin O'Byrne is from SDG&E, and, &E and, and uh, a month ago we had in Rob Anderson, who is the lead system planner for the utility here, and really dealing with an enormous amount of uncertainty and variety, whether it be solar on the rooftop, um, electric vehicles being plugged in at night, wind and solar, intermittent wind and solar going into the system, requirements for generation storage uh, into the system. This, this utility is so different than what it was 10 years ago around the country, and it's, it looks like distributed generation with solar, with grid storage, and in there, there's vehicles now that are, that are actually both being charged and sometimes maybe vehicles going back and supporting the grid too. So uh, if they're, 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 it's a tough job being a utility nowadays and I think our utility is doing it as well or better than anybody that I, I've seen because we're, we're ahead in terms of renewable generation. We have, we're second in the country in terms of solar on the rooftop so certainly something to be proud of here in San Diego. Um, so with that, I want to invite Colin to come up here. Colin, again, with California Center for Sustainable Energy. If you're on a laptop, would you go ahead and you can hit escape to get out of this or minimize it. And if you see a blue screen, if you see a blue screen come up, would you do me a favor, hit function F4. If the, if the blue screen comes up, hit function F4. Just click on it. So now you're going to the first slide deck. The first slide deck slide at the bottom, you'll see a PowerPoint at the bottom show. that says EVs CSE Santuli. So, so find that one. Yeah. To start. A lot of you went, a lot of, a lot of this happened. Okay, so a lot of you have to hit 11. function F4 to have the screen go back from blue okay, screen. And then, uh, Try that on number one, Ron. Should show up on. Hit function F4. To, let's start the show. This Same to you, Alex. Hit function F4. No, I'm sorry, function at the bottom, function key F4. Function key F4. Function F4. Let's see it start to come up. So function's down here somewhere, FN, and then F4. I may need to help them as we go around. Just hang on a little bit. You want this pointer? Yeah. Let's see if that helped. And you're still blue. EVs, CSE, Santuli, and if and you want to open the number, slide number that you're sitting on. So let me go back one, you're on screen six. Oh, we might and be lucky. Get the function key of four and that. And then there we go. And then four, click duplication. Hit the whole yeah, all screen. The all these other presentations. Yeah, try that. Yeah, I put, pull together all these decks. Or try, this, try the one next to it. Oh, so it's it's still thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. need to start the screen show and get to did, slide did along. Clear my nose. Um, I don't have my glasses, so I <laughs> can't help you. At least I'm not don't worry about alone the in that one. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're or there you go. Animation slideshow, and then here, from beginning. yeah, or from current slide. Yeah, try that. And as long as that's slide 11, you should be good. Let's see if it comes. Yeah, up. I was happy to see that settlement go is through. That slide and 11, and you're up. Start seeing some progress on that. So you do it on the application, hopefully. And so then, if, once you have it up, go up under slideshow and say slideshow from current slide. Number one, number two, your Alex, your slide should be number two. And number three, over there, we'll go up here to the slideshow. What do you do? Hold around and fix this column. All right. Okay. Well, I'll admit we might have a little bit of slide uh, technical issues because I, I have some animation on my slides that is going to probably may. We have an animation of that slide. Haven't saved. Press the down button. Okay, sounds good. Well, you did a, a great job introducing uh, our organization and, and myself, but I'll do a, a quick recap. Colin Santuli, I oversee the transportation programs for the Center for Sustainable Energy. 
We're a nonprofit based here in San Diego. We started as a San Diego uh, Regional Energy Office as part of SANDAG, the regional uh, planning agency. We since have uh, broken off and we're now a nonprofit. And as of last year, we uh, started working outside California, we're, uh, Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut. But our heart is still very much here in San Diego as our headquarters is. So we work regularly with SANDAG, uh, with the city, uh, and with the other regional agencies. So uh, moving on here. Um, they, I was asked today to talk about a number of things, and um, will your next ca car be an electric vehicle? And I know we have sdg &E presenting in a little bit, and we have an expert over here who's going to talk about his own personal experience as well as what's going on um, uh, in, in the agencies that he's working with. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page before we jumped into some of the, the details, and that's just basic EV 101, making sure that, that our language is, is straight, make sure we know what a, a PHEV is versus a, an all-battery electric. And talk about the vehicles that are out there, some misconceptions about lack of vehicles on the roads, and then uh, there's some misconceptions about cost of vehicles. So we'll talk about some, some cost also. We'll cover real quickly market trends, and I'm over here on slide three. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you with um, an opportunity. I just want to make sure we, if there's one thing you remember, it is opportunity to go actually be able to test drive the vehicles for free in a very low pressure, non-sales environment here in San Diego. And that's coming up in a few months. Okay, so uh, PEV 101 here on slide four. Um, just a show of hands, how many folks either drive an EV in the room, not counting the presenters? Any EV drivers? One, two, three. So, so not bad. Then how many folks would be able to tell the difference between a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and a battery electric vehicle before the slides? Okay, so we'll do a quick overview, but most of the folks are, are aware of that. And the biggest difference is, if you're looking up here at, at slide five, is this... Um, this gasoline fuel source. So, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle has the ability to run both on gas and electricity, whereas a full battery electric vehicle, there's no tailpipe, there's no gas tank, there's no ability, there's no um, engine. It's just a motor that that runs um, off of electricity. And if slide five and slide or computer five and six can hit the down button for me, I think six might have hit. <laughs> We'll just run with this. So the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, the main ones on the road right now, the, the Chevy Volt, the uh, Prius has a plug-in, and they're getting ready to release that one to almost double the range. Um, Ford has a number of plug-ins, as well as Honda. There you go. There's our slide. It has a number of plug-ins. Here on slide uh, screen six, which is slide seven, we've got uh, the all-electric vehicles. And there's a number of vehicles that are currently available now, the Leaf. Uh, the Ford Focus Electric, which I drive, uh, BMW has uh, a couple, or has one all-electric vehicle. Um, but the, the important thing is we have a number of new vehicles coming out. Um, currently, we have 23 models that are on the market from 16 different brands, and that's only going to get uh, increase looking at um, 20, the rest of 2014 and then 2015 and 2016. So 2014, you'll, we... We have seen additions from BMW, Hyundai, um, another one for a vehicle from Cadillac. Kia and Volkswagen entered the all-electric space. And 2014 was really the year of the, the all-battery electrics as far as new vehicle releases. And then 2015, uh, if you look at the vehicles that are expected to come out, uh, much more variety in the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle category. So Volvo, Audi, um, Hyundai, the Chevy Volt, which is Probably the most popular plug-in hybrid is going to uh, be revamped, uh, pretty significantly extending its range uh, and its um, capacity. Uh, and then there's a number of other um, vehicles you can see there on the list. Importantly, we're starting to see, um, that I think we've been missing, we're starting to see a new body type, the uh, small SUV being added to plug-in hybrid electrics as well, which we've needed here. The, the Outlander, we've been waiting for a long time for that, those who are tracking the industry. Uh, but the Outlander and then the Volvo are, are two small SUVs. Uh, which uh, should help those who have, um, have a need to carry or have a need to drive SUVs. And then lastly, upcoming in the BEVs, um, this is 2015 and beyond. Uh, we're going to see more all-electric vehicles with extended range. And so that's the Chevy Volt, the Model X specifically, uh, the Model 3 is coming, uh, and a couple other um, vehicles listed there. But the point is, that what I want to leave with you guys with for this first 12 slides is that... Um, not only the correct nomenclature for vehicles, but also just to uh, let you guys know that if you're, if you're Ford people, if you're Honda people, if you're an Audi person, 
as many folks are pretty dedicated to, to brands in the auto industry, chances are the, the brand that you typically like to drive has a plug-in model or has a plug-in version of one of the models you're already driving. For myself, what's a BEV? A battery electric vehicle. Battery electric. Okay, got it. Yeah. And F FC is fuel cell? Fuel cell electric vehicle I kind of skipped over because we're, we're I'm focusing on plug-in plug hybrid, or excuse me, plug-in electric vehicles today. All right. Questions about this first 12? The, the fuel cell has more range. I would like to have that one. So no, the fuel cell, we can talk about the fuel cell. There's three fuel cells that are currently available. Um, there's not, um, two of those aren't available in San Diego because the releases of the fuel cell, the manufacturers are limiting the release to areas in the state that actually have uh, fueling locations now. And currently that's, that's just LA. Um, but the state is very committed to fuel cell as a technology and they're committed to infrastructure. Um, for today, I, we, with uh, having the utility represented and thinking about the connection with solar, uh, I was focusing mostly on plug-in. Um, so can't we use that wonderful solar power to make hydrogen? Absolutely. No, there's definitely renewable hydrogen available. There's a lot of hydrogen should be included in the conversation with renewables, definitely, without a doubt. We're, we're probably a few years away from being able to have this type of conversation with fuel cells when we're talking about 23 different models. From, um, from more than a dozen manufacturers. Is that one for you? No. Any other questions for this? Or just a good introduction? I'm thrilled that there's that many options on the market. Yeah. You know, I remember just a few just years ago, to get to 23. Two. So this is, I think this is, what's been, this is what's the game changer that everybody's coming out with. Um, okay, so if you're on a laptop, count to 12, go forward 12, right click 12, or add 12 to yeah, your number. So we should see 13 through 24 all the way around. I think many of these are numbered. So there's 13 right there on number one. So number two should be 14, right? Number three should be 15. So add 12 to your number. And if there's any problems, I'll help out. So OK. Uh, so there's a number of vehicles available. Um, so that uh, the, the excuse of, well, they don't have my my model, they don't have my size, they don't have uh, my color, those are all out the window now because manufacturers have brought vehicles to the market. So now we'll spend a few minutes looking at the benefits of driving EVs. So starting over here from screen one, and this is, these are just uh, on average, but high level benefits. Driving EVs, you pay about half the fuel as you, um, half for your fuel cost to drive an electric vehicle. And that's generally a broad statement. You can pay a lot less depending on certain rates, and uh, it, it also depends on, uh, on obviously, the gas prices. But the takeaway is you, you pay a lot less for your fuel cost. Another big incentive here, and a benefit on, on the second screen here, is there's a, lot of, there's a number of incentives that are available from the state. So the governor has um, committed to this type of technology, and he is putting his money where his mouth is, uh, for lack of a better way to say it. So as far as incentives go, uh, you get up to a $2,500 rebate for um, plug-in electric vehicles from the state, and then the federal tax credit, uh, that's the federal government giving you a break on your taxes, assuming you have that much tax liability, of course. Uh, if you don't have this high of a tax liability, you can take advantage of that tax credit through leasing a vehicle. Leases are... Yeah. I'm sorry? You can also carry it forward. Carry it forward. So yeah, that's my question. Can, how many years can it go forward? You say, they're saying carry forward that tax credit. I, you I carry it forward. Sure. Probably wouldn't we'll speak to that. Back and four forward, but to check with your, two, uh, three, your accountant. Three. Three. It's that, that's my standard answer. Is uh, I'm not a tax professional, so check with your tax professional. And so then the next slide here. So we've got lower fuel costs. We have incentives to bring down the upfront cost. Uh, and that, you have a little tough seeing the graph here, but what that equals is lower total cost of ownership. And so savings approximately here, your red line is um, an internal combustion engine vehicle, and your blue line is um, an all-electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle, approximately $8,000 of savings after seven years. And if you're the kind of person who drives a car for 15 years, it's $20,000 of savings. Um, going back to fuel costs, you save 
typical EV driver saves between seven fifteen and twelve hundred in fuel cost alone. So moving on here to screen five, the other big benefit that might not be uh, immediately hitting your pocketbook, but is definitely hitting the state's pocketbook or benefiting the state's pocketbook, is uh, the public health benefit. So reducing emissions and air pollution. And some stats on here, but the biggest one to take away is that uh, local air pollution uh, causes a tremendous amount for the state and for, uh, for just for public agencies in general through uh, risk work day, missed work days, missed school absences, um, for a whole bunch of medical costs. 2.5 billion is um, it's just a staggering number to me, and, and this is all coming from our um, these numbers are all coming from the American Lung Association who. Uh, who does a good job tracking these types of um, cost to society. So moving on again, even kind of broader outside of the state, the year greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And, uh, and the, Peter talked about this in the beginning. The, the takeaway here is about, for the state, about roughly 40% of our emissions come from transportation. And the San Diego, uh, it's a little bit, transportation emissions are a little bit larger than that. And then roughly about half of that 40% comes from light duty transportation. So the cars that all of us drove in and out of the city today, you're, it's accounting for 20% of the state and roughly the county's emissions. So the ability, it's, it's a really kind of low hanging fruit for us to be able to tackle. Some of these other pies, really challenging to reduce the emissions from those areas. Uh, changing um, our vehicles is, is something we can uh, make a big impact here. Moving down here on the our time saving, another benefit is our, our time savings. And so currently, you can get access to the HOV lane. Um, depending on where you live, this can be straight up money in your pocket if you are the kind of person who bills by the hour. And in some areas in the LA region, this is probably one of the, the top motivators for, for EVs right now is the ability to get into the carpool lane uh, with just a single occupancy. And then lastly, behind me here, the one benefit that is kind of tough to, to throw numbers on is how much fun these cars are to drive. Uh, and I know I can speak myself as being a Ford Focus electric driving, uh, driver, and our company has been able to test drive and have um, test vehicles from a number of manufacturers. We have uh, a Volt in our offices throughout the, the state, and, and they're just fantastic to drive. The pickup on them is, is tremendous, and, and that is, um, the only metric you can throw on the fun is, is kind of all the, uh, the number of awards from Motor Trend, from uh, Consumer Reports, and many of the other auto um, magazines or auto kind of rankings that uh, EVs have regularly been ranked uh, highest on customer satisfaction and on performance um, when compared to other vehicles. So those are the benefits, but we'll keep going and we'll stop on slide 12. But the, that's the benefits of driving EV, but we're going to switch back a little bit to speaking about uh, our nomenclature and making sure we're all on the same page before we get into the other two presentations today. Question? Well, there is one quickie on your federal best credit. Sure. You gotta use the mic. When you're talking to be heard on the, the you gotta use the microphone to be heard on the camera. Uh, one quickie on the federal tax credit. Uh, when the first when tax credits first came out, if you were in the income tax, where you got income tax bracket rate, where you got hit by well, the alternative minimum tax, the AMT, uh, you could not take that credit. Uh, Congress has since then enacted a law saying that the AMT will not knock that credit off your income tax. Good information. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so swip switching to charging, that's another uh, big question that we get, and another uh, excuse that we get thrown at us. Why can't I? I don't have anywhere to charge this vehicle. I can't drive an EV because I don't know how I'm going to get my fuel. So starting with the charging basics here on slide, or screen nine, excuse me. You'll hear level one and level two used a lot, I, I think, in the other presentations potentially. And uh, the easiest way to think about this, level one, without getting into uh, too technical, level one is uh, you just plug into a normal house outlet. An outlet you have that you plug your toaster or your blender into, um, that is going to be a standard 110 um, outlet. You can plug in the charging cord that comes with every vehicle. And you can charge, if you have a garage or if you have a, an access to a 110 outlet, you can charge using 110. So you don't have to purchase uh, a separate charging piece of equipment. And it does take longer to charge, but I know that I had charged on level one myself in my house uh, for about six months when I was waiting to have my charger installed. It can be done, it just depends, you have to do the math and depend on how far are you going from work to do the math on how, if you have workplace charging uh, and, and how long your, your car is gonna be sitting at home charging. So the next is level two. 
These are pictures of um, what you typically see on public level two, two charging or workplace level two charging. But level two charging can also occur in the home. And I'm get, I'll get to home and public here in a second. Uh, level two uh, almost gives you twice, if not more, miles per hour of charge, if you can think about it that way. Level two is what most EV drivers have in their home, uh, in their garage. It's where with mo most of the public charging you'll see right around the corner in Ace uh, parking lot, they have three level two chargers. Um, if you are charging at home, again, it's not, um, it's not an, uh, a special electrical upgrade that you need. If you have a wiring for a dryer, then you should have the wiring, you should have the capability to install a level two. You still need to tell your utility you're installing a level two charger. You still need to make sure you're using a certified electrician if you're going to put a charger in your garage. Um, but one key takeaway is the, for most people who live in homes that were built in the last 30 years, you're going to have the electrical capacity to put a level two in if you have a single family home, generally. Uh, and then lastly, DC fast charging. And these are uh, like we, they're, we've used commercial grade, and this is uh, because this presentation is intended for a public audience and a consumer audience, and we, we don't want folks thinking that they can install a DC fast charger in their home because it has the, it's the quickest to charge, and we get a lot of questions about that. But um, the takeaway of this is that uh, it uses direct current, so it, it, um, it ch charges significantly faster. You can get about 80% of a vehicle's capacity in 30 minutes. Fast charge? Yeah, the question was, are all EVs capable of doing the fast charge? And the answer is not all EV. All EVs are capable, but not all EVs have a port built into them, which that connects to DC fast charging. So, some technically all EVs are capable, but not all EVs have a port. Some manufacturers offer the option to pay extra to get the port on. Some it comes standard. It just depends on on the vehicle. Ford Focus that I drive doesn't have a DC fast charge port. And it's not an option to add one. Nissan, you can add. OK, and so we were talking about charging at home and charging at work and charging um, um, at the workplace. This uh, pyramid here is uh, courtesy of our friends at, at NYSERDA, uh, the state government in New York. Uh, the big takeaway from this is that the majority of charging happens at home. I'm going to show some maps in a minute here, and people talk a lot about public charging, but uh, a big takeaway is the large majority of charging is going to happen at your home. So if there's not a public charger between your house and your office, it doesn't mean you can't drive an EV. Or if there's not a public charger between your house and your, your kid's school, you still can get an EV because the majority of your charging is going to happen at home. And the very top of that pyramid then is, is DC fast charging. So. You have level one, level two fast charging, which is going to be more ubiquitous, and, and you'll see that through the maps. And then DC fast chargers are going to be, uh, the cost is higher. Um, they're going to not be as, um, as available or as frequently available in San Diego. Yeah, it is. And this kind of links up with uh, the other maps. So this is the 2012, but we're going to, I'm going to show the 20, 2015. So. Well, let's, let's stop here. So questions on this set. Anything that you'd like to talk to you about the benefits or the charging question? Just a, a quick question on slide three in terms of the cost of ownership. Uh, what's that based on? I assume that the electric vehicles, are they priced comparable to an internal combustion engine vehicle to start with? And it's all based on the uh, lesser cost of the uh, price per miles per gallon, you know. Uh, it's, well, two things are not comparable. Uh, so a ticket sales price of uh, a Ford Focus for a Ford Focus electric, they're, they're considerably higher. Electric vehicles are, have a higher cost, which is one of the reasons why the federal government and the state government is providing incentive to bring down that upfront cost. But the cost of ownership comes mostly from fuel savings and maintenance. Uh, there's a significant amount of maintenance savings that comes from driving an EV as well. Is the VA included in the lowered cost? Yes. Total cost of ownership, yep. But without the rebate? Without the rebate, we wouldn't see the same cost savings. Yes. 
Well, how That's long correct. do the rebates last? Uh, do we know? Is that uh, we we manage the the state rebate project. We've been, it's been around since 2010, and it it gets renewed annually. So the state's answer is it's only going to last this year, but it's a commitment of of the governor to support the, some of the goals and some of the, the growth that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And there, there's a lot of support from a number of folks to, um, from a, a number of different areas to continue the rebate uh, until the upfront cost, or until the, the vehicles become a little more cost comparable with internal combustion engine vehicles. Federal, they've, in my opinion, the federal uh, government has done a much better job at providing some level of, um, uh, of planning for the, uh, the manufacturers because they've given manufacturers targets. So uh, I believe it's 200,000 vehicles per manufacturer. So when Nissan sells 200,000 Leafs, it doesn't go away. It, it just actually reduces slightly. Same with all the other manufacturers. We're a long way from one manufacturer hitting that. So um, yeah, you're looking yeah, three to five years, but that's, that's just throwing a number out there that um, based on the current growth. We're hoping that the growth continues to go way up. Colin, you mentioned maintenance. I'm going to say you haven't put an oil change into this no. vehicle at all, right? No oil. There's no oil in the all-electric vehicle at all. So another savings that probably doesn't show up in that vehicle yeah, that, right there at all, right? That's incorporated. So this, yeah, this is a Department of Energy's uh, alternative fuel data center calculator, and they, they do a really good job of um, looking at all those costs. And so that, that is included in total cost ownership. Okay, great. Other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, the total cost uh, that you have here, does that include battery replacement? And what's the expected life of a, of a battery for an electric vehicle in general? It will get that uh, question a lot. And the, the general answer that I, that I typically give is that all batteries that are in vehicles that are available for the state rebate, so there's there are some electric vehicles that are not from major manufacturers that this won't apply to, but all the major manufacturer vehicles, all the ones I've covered, they have a 10-year, 100,000-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And if there's a problem with your battery, uh, much like any other warranty, your manufacturer will deal with it. There, that's the simplest way to look at it. There's a, there's a lot of issues with battery degradation that sometimes the warranty won't cover. Um, but the short answer is uh, typically your battery if there's a, a defect in your battery, it will be covered by uh, the manufacturer. And has anybody re had to replace the battery in their cars yet, in their EVs or their plug-ins? Peter? No. no. I know I Seven replaced nine. the battery in my Prius, which is not a plug-in, but it's a hybrid. That was a $2,000 replacement to replace that in the Prius, but I think it extended the life of that Prius another 100,000 miles. What year is your Prius? 19, two, I said 2001. It was the first one off the boat almost. Oh, my wife was ahead of me. She said, let's get it off the boat. And we're still driving it. It's got 190,000 miles now. Got the new battery at 140. Uh -huh. okay. Still running great. We good on these, this set? All right, good. So count to 12 again if you're at a laptop. Go forward to 12. So on number one, we should see slide number 25 on number one. So for whatever number you're at, add 24, right? I know you guys can do this. One more, two more. There you go. So these maps are going to be a little hard to see, unfortunately. They don't come out too sharp. OK, we'll breeze by the maps. OK, good. And I'll help you with the rest. OK. So we finished talking about that pyramid where the, the big thing to take away is the majority of your charging happens at home. But there is an option for, for charging elsewhere, and we're going to look at public charging infrastructure here. So the, the last map we saw over here, the, we just had a handful of chargers in 2012. And in 2015, we have um, significantly more. These are all level two chargers. DC fast chargers in 2015, excuse me, um, back in 2012, we only had two. And now, um, as you can see, we have that. This is San Diego down here going up to I think this is up in Carlsbad now. So over 500 charging stations, uh, 30 DC fast charging uh, stations now, and there's, there's more going in every day, literally. Kevin can tell you all about that, I'm sure. So this, these will be uh, public charging stations. 
Uh, but I, again, I want to emphasize that charging happens at home for the majority of us. And I'll, I'll move quickly through these slides here, these screens here, because we, we kind of had a, a snapshot already. But just looking at the market trends, just so if you're thinking about buying an EV, you don't think you're alone out there. You don't think, uh, I want you to know that there are, in California here, over 100,000 drivers currently. The growth uh, last year was about 41%, which is tremendous if you think about um, technology growth. Um, looking at market share, uh, so 5% of new cars in the fourth quarter of 2014 were uh, plug-in electric vehicles. So I think that's something like one in 18 new cars. So think about it, every time a new car gets sold, I think that's the, the math there, one in 18 was a plug-in electric vehicle. So um, definitely not alone if you're thinking about buying an EV. There's definitely a lot of vehicles being sold in the state. Uh, these maps here just kind of show where the growth is in the state, not surprisingly, looking at registrations. You, you see a lot of the uh, most vehicles in the high population area. In San Diego, we have roughly 10,000. If you look at the, the map to the right of it, we just normalize that by population, and you start to see um, the Bay Area, the South Bay is, has the highest per capita EV registrations, at least for, from 2010 through 14. San Diego is holding strong there at 4.2. Uh, and then if you kind of slide over here, two maps, and you look at the percent change in that density from 2013 to 2014, remember the state here was at 41%, and San Diego uh, grew by 43%. So we're, we're beating the state average if you, in terms of growth. Interestingly, some of the biggest growth areas are in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, which they started from a lower, kind of a lower baseline because they, they didn't have as many vehicles back in the beginning of 2013, but... Uh, but it's definitely noteworthy, some pretty aggressive sales deals out there. And there's also an additional incentive in the San Joaquin Valley that provides an additional $300,000, excuse me, $3,000 off the upfront uh, cost, which helps sales a lot in the valley. And again, this is just that same sales trend just for San Diego County. Um, I, point being, it looks a lot like the California sales trend and then highlighting that, that 43%. Um, the market share in the, on our last screen here, not surprisingly, Nissan, Chevy, uh, the top vehicle makes, followed by Tesla, Ford, and Toyota. Interesting, uh, San Diego kind of sticks out from the rest of the state. Statewide, this average is actually split the other way. You see about uh, 40, excuse me, about 58% of the vehicles <laughs> plug-ins in the state are plug-in hybrid, and 40% are all battery. In San Diego, we have um, higher percentage of all battery electric vehicles. All right, good. Questions? we got just a couple slides after this, but questions around charging stations about the growth of the market? Anybody here? Yes. Where is that $3,000 rebate coming from in the Central Valley? Uh, they... I'm not... It's the Air District funds it, but I'm not sure who, the, who funds the Air District. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we align the state rebate really closely with uh, the regional rebate there. So, it's San Joaquin uh, Air Something District. Yeah, the Air Pollution Control District. And can you speak to the prices of public charging? I know there's one near my wife's business, and the Blink charges about I think it's 49 cents or 59 cents. Yeah, it, right? it really varies, and maybe I'll, I'll defer that question, because I, I know okay. there's, there's probably a lot of expertise in the other two presenters, but okay. what I'll just say is that a lot of variation depending on, um, depending on the, who's operating the station. Okay. It can go from free all the way to a couple bucks. Good. Other questions about this, about the growth of the market or plug-ins? Yes. Ray? Those public charging stations, uh, those are separate from a workplace station, or is that include? Yeah, these are public works. These so are public stations. The only chance that, that we would capture a workplace here is if that workplace made it available to the public. And so I, I know at our old, our former building at the Center for Sustainable Energy, we had charging in our parking lot, but it was it's on a, a well-traveled road, and we didn't restrict the the access of that charging to someone from the public. So if someone was wanted to come in and charge, they could. Uh, but this is, um, so those types of stations would be captured here. SDG&E has public charging for, at their headquarters at, uh, in Kearney Mesa, and that's not available to the public. So that, that would, specifically workplace, that wouldn't be captured here. 
A lot of great opportunities in workplace charging that I'm sure Kevin's going to talk a lot about. Okay, then we'll finish up here. So the one thing I really wanted you guys to walk away with is if, if you want to get a chance to test drive vehicles, I can't stress enough this opportunity here. Um, it's National Drive Electric Week, organized by Sierra Club. Last year they had 100 events. Uh, this year they're looking to do 150 nationwide. San Diego is one of their, um, one of their keystone <laughs> events, and it was featured last year out of a, of a few dozen nationwide, and I'm sure next year it will be the same as well. We partner with SDG&E, and uh, the event last year was at Liberty Station. It's very likely to be at Liberty Station again. Um, I think we had, we, we gave over 600 test drives last year. They're all free. We bring manufacturers in. Some dealers do come, but it's a very low stress, low pressure environment. You can test drive all the vehicles. Uh, you can test drive them as many times as you want or as, as, uh, as many as you want. They're typically, we have uh, free food there and some solar, solar contractors come and talking about how you can make a connection to. I can't stress enough if you want to test drive a vehicle to, to attend the event there. Give me a hand. Any final questions for Colin? Or are you good on that? Tom? Yeah, one last one. is If you have the uh, 220 service in your property, in your residence, in your garage, for less than $400, you can buy a plug-in level 2 charger. Tom knows a lot about electric vehicles, by the way. <laughs> He's a resident expert here as well. Uh, so for the next presentation, it's if you'll actually minimize this, you can hit escape. You can all hit escape. Unfortunately, it's going to go back to that blue screen that I, I messed up before. So what, what you have to do is you have to, in the bottom, there's a little key that says function. And up here, you have to hit F4. And when you do that, a screen comes up. And I want you to pick the one that says duplicate. So if you have a hard time figuring that out, I'll come around and help you. Somebody can come around and help you. But the next presentation says Norby. The, the, the presentation at the bottom, look at the one that says Norby and bring that up. Norby, S-D-R-E-S. -E and then if you're at screen one, I think you know how to do that. Screen two, you know how to do that. Pete, I'll help you again here. Start to see, and they're numbered at the bottom left-hand corner. So ideally, it will come up with numbers all the way around, and I think we're really close. So Petter Norby, uh, head of the County Planning Commission, has, has, has advised a number of electric vehicle companies um, and test-driven 100,000 miles of electric vehicles out there. Uh, does a pre Well, you'll see in the presentation that, that he talk, talks about solar being a transportation fuel. Almost, you know, you know, mind blowing when you hear that as a com as a as a as a headline. But uh, this is a guy that drives it, lives it, and uh, convinced me that this is the way to go uh, on your next car purchase. Peter, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, first, uh, let's just start with a correction. I'm one of seven county planning commissioners that does uh, land use planning for the county of San Diego, and of course, we have. I don't know everyone, a staff of uh, several hundred that, that helped the planning commissioners out. So it's great to be here with you tonight. Um, let's just get started right away. And it's this great time in, in our history, our kind of evolutionary history as a species that we're arriving at this wonderful intersection. And this intersection is a combination of the kind of the uh, communications revolution of the last 30 years that we're all familiar with. Uh, and now kind of new internets, if you will, of transportation and energy and new ways of looking uh, at that. And it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's technology moving forward providing us answers that we simply didn't have 30 or 40 years ago. So that intersection, if we'll just take a look at slide two, where, where is my pointer? Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, we'll just look at slide two here. Uh, traditionally, over the last 100 years, the west coast of the United States was built. Uh, we have dwellings. Uh, they're powered by power plants and utilities, uh, very few. We have three major utilities in the state of California. Uh, the private automobile is by far our choice of transportation, and then that automobile has had a mandatory relationship with a gas station. Uh, that's basically been the last 100 years. And this intersection in history 
that we're at now, thanks for communications and technology, is you can have a dwelling and you can have a power plant on the roof of your dwelling to provide energy for the dwelling. And you can have a car that doesn't have a relationship with a gas station but has a relationship with your house that plugs into your house that gets energy from the plant on your, your home. So that's kind of the new world that we're entering. Uh, there is approximately 140,000 EVP PEV drivers in the state of California, and over 20% of them are, are choosing this method to power their car with renewable energy with solar. So, so we have, uh, you know, the previous uh, speaker with uh, Center for Sustainable Energy kind of started his, his timeline around 2010, 2011, and we start around 2008. Uh, Mini E, uh, BMW was out with a field test prototype vehicle and then Tesla was launching their first 250 of their Tesla Roadsters in 2009. So we had about 500 EVs in the state of California. That also doesn't include home conversions or some legacy EVs back from the 1990s such as the first Toyota RAV4. Um, in San Diego County we had about mm, 8 to 10 of these little guys. Uh, I had one of them and then there was about two dozen Tesla Roadsters so that's way before uh, that, and you can see how rapidly it's grown. It's grown from 500 to 10,000, 75,000. Now in the state of California, approximately 140,000. Previous speaker slides at 125, 130. Uh, this is just a newer number uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, I do uh, work with BMW as one of my clients. Um, so let's just take a look in terms of BMW, what has happened. They, we got into the program in 2008. Uh, AC Propulsions did our conversions of the car. The battery costs were $1,000 per kilowatt. So for a car that drove 85 miles, you were paying $35,000 for the battery. Uh, by 2011, the first vehicle is what we called a validation vehicle, done by a third party. 2011 was their development mule, which carried all of the BMW parts. Uh, battery prices were down to $450 per kilowatt. Uh, we were in a battery pack cost of a little over $13,000. And then in 2013, getting ready for the launch of their retail car, which launched in 2014, a three-year levelized contract for batteries at $300 per kilowatt. So we're down to $6,000 for a battery pack. Now you'll notice the miles are the same, uh, but this isn't the same. So how can you get a 20 kilowatt battery pack that goes as far as the 30 kilowatt battery pack? And the answer is because this car weighs 2,600 pounds. It's made out of carbon fiber. It's very, very light. And the Active E, the car in front of it, weighed 4,000 pounds. So it's 1,400 pounds lighter, roughly a third lighter, thus requiring less batteries. Um, internally, we see 2017 as a great tipping point. We see battery costs coming below $200 a kilowatt. We see Nissan coming out with their, level, their second gen car. Uh, of course, uh, Chevy is out with their second gen Volt. We see Tesla coming out in 2017 or 18 with their Gen 3 car, um, and then the Chevy Bolt coming out. So range is going to be all over the map. Uh, generally speaking, the base range will be around 150 miles to 200 miles. Tesla's will go farther. And then BMW's strategy really is a series of plug-in hybrids. So what, what wasn't on that slide in terms of available cars is in one month you'll be able to buy an X5 with a plug, a plug-in hybrid. In December, you'll be able to buy a 3 Series BMW with a plug. And then just announced today, the 7 Series will be available with a plug about six months from now. So BMW, in the next 18 months, all of their lineup from top to bottom will have plug-in uh, hybrids available, which is really, really exciting. So that's just a little kind of background on what's going on here. And then now kind of our personal story, two gas cars uh, transitioning to two electric cars. Our decisions were driven by values and performance. I like uh, premium and performance cars. Uh, we got into the Mini E program. We, we really weren't sure the car would work for us, and we kept our two gas cars. My wife works and I work. About three months after not driving that car, we sold it. Um, now we're in this kind of one EV, one gas uh, household. We're happy campers. I'm driving the car for two and a half years, 35,000 miles. We're getting ready to shift into the active E. I'm so excited. I'm getting this great BMW. And my wife tells me I'm driving that car. So uh, that was a shock. Uh, first of all, I wasn't ready for. And I told her, honey, I'm the pioneer here that's working with BMW. No, I'm driving the car. And she said, would you like to be happily married or do you want to drive the car? And so I chose uh, happily married. Uh, exactly right. Uh, we could not get two of the active E's from BMW, even though I was doing some work for them. I've done four documentary films with them and training and all kinds of prototype work with them. 
Uh, very, very limited car, just 500 across the United States, and um, we couldn't get two of them. So I had to go back to a gas car. I went back to an Infiniti G35, and I, great car. I hated it. I just couldn't wait to get back into an electric car. Um, Julie had a great experience with the Active E for a couple of years, so we both desired to be in premium electric cars, and so we purchased in May of 2014. We purchased uh, two BMW i3s, so a little over a year ago. And let's just kind of skip forward to this slide here, slide number seven. So as you look at me, you see a fairly large man, middle-aged, balding. But when I look at myself, uh, this, is, this is who I am. Uh, this is me. So this is me when I look in the mirror, right? A uh, little whimsical, a little fun, a little bit of a troublemaker. I could, you know, that's me. I strap a rocket to my back. I don't care if I crash and burn, whatever. And I think everything's possible, right? So this imagination, this endless imagination of a child. Uh, and, and, you know, everything was once impossible until somebody did it. So we have this uh, wonderful home that we built in, in 2006. We were quite honored in 2007 to receive the Sandy Award from the California Center, Center for Sustainable Energy which is now the Center for Sustainable Energy. And I think the award is now called Energy Excellence Award, and they've changed the name of that. But it's given to one home in San Diego County to recognize the outstanding energy efficiency and achievement of that home. And so we have this kind of beautiful uh, home that we built in 2006 uh, with solar on it. And then we have these two great cars, by the way. They're the most efficient car on the planet. So there's a big efficiency story here. And, and it just came to us kind of like this little rocket kid. What, what, if, what if we could demonstrate that you can live in a home and power two cars with solar energy, with, with no gasoline bill, and, and really no utility bill? What if? Can we do it? So we set off on a 12-month challenge, beginning when we got the cars and ending this May, just a month ago, um, to, to do just that. Uh, and it's really a simple idea. On a small portion of our roof, uh, we can provide the energy to power that house and to power the two cars. And that's net energy. So that means I'm generating this amount of energy and I'm using that amount of energy. And during the night, I'm pulling from the grid. We're grid connected. But during the day, my neighbors are getting my excess renewable energy. OK, so you, know, you, you generate what you use. So this is our home here on slide number eight. You can see uh, it's about 20 to 25 percent of the roof. Uh, it's covered with solar panels, so a small portion of the roof. And what's really interesting here, we built our house in 2006. You can see we put all of our roof penetrations to the north side of the house. And we did that to keep the roof on the south side of the house clean and ready for solar PV. Uh, here's our, our year. We were, we were covered uh, by BMW. We were covered by ChargePoint, uh, Inside EV, uh, monthly updates on Inside EV. So we were monitored by both BMW and ChargePoint for our year. Uh, basically, uh, we put on 21,500 miles on the cars. We used a little over 5,000 kilowatts from the wall. Um, so there were some charging losses in the, in the car when it converts the electricity. We generated 13,546 kilowatts of electricity in our solar PV. And for the year, we had a net use of 500 uh, kilowatts of electricity, which is very low. That's about half of a month of a typical home. Um, and that's our yearly use. That's one year. That's a cumulative total for the year. OK, and so the reason that this number is positive is we decided to host a French exchange student for a year through our Rotary Club who had a massive head of hair and who blow dried her hair for 20 minutes each morning. So Paraline was good for about 100, 100 kilowatts a month, and about 1,200 kilowatts a year. So we were, we were slightly in the positive, ever so slightly. And then here was our cost uh, for the year. We had a $751 and 58 cent credit. Now that energy credit is because of time of use. Um, if you're using the energy, you can use that credit. But if you're below zero on that credit, that just uh, reverts to the utility. You, you actually don't get a check for $751. Uh, we did get a check for $38.76, something around there. Um, that's against about $190 worth of uh, natural gas use for the house for the year. So this kind of credit of $751 versus $190 for natural gas use, which is, I think, an incredible story for a house and two cars driving 20,000 miles. Here's a look at where we are this year, the first four winter months of the year. This is what we call a net energy bill. Uh, when you're a net energy customer, solar customer, you pay your bill once a year. But every month, you get uh, an update, a kind of a bill-like thing in the mail that you take a look, and it shows you how you're doing. Um, and I think the important thing here if you can see right here for the year, we're 300 and I think it's 95 or 349 um, 
over generating for the year during the four winter months. And so this year we're going to be somewhere between minus 1,000 and minus 1,200 kilowatts for the year, meaning that we're producing more energy that we're using for the house and the car. Uh, again, we'll be somewhere we're currently at like $200 in credit. We'll be somewhere around $1,000 in credit, higher than that number, um, which we can't use. So it means I put too big of a solar system on my house, basically, is what it means from an economic standpoint. But we're not driven by economics. We're driven by the desire to make as much energy as we generate or as we use. Okay, this slide here, uh, this is the heartbeat of the two cars. So we, as I mentioned ChargePoint, they're a provider of electric vehicle service equipment. Um, they, uh, you can see it on slide 12, they provided us with a commercial unit that allows us to, uh, we have these little charge point cards and Julie uses this card to unleash her port and I use my card to unleash my port. So we're able to see exactly what each car is using from the wall and what each driver is using from the wall and this is kind of the, the daily heartbeat. And so this is the summer months where we're driving a little bit more and this is the week in between Christmas and New Year's. We were driving around, and, uh, but you know, pretty average throughout the whole year. That represents about 5,000 uh, uh, 5, kilowatts of energy and 12 months worth of driving, 21,000 miles. Great. Questions of competitors? Doing it, obviously, day to day, and, and leading, leading, I think, some of our current planning questions. I was just wondering, do you use the public uh, charging facilities at all? I would, you know, if I were to put a percentage on it, I would say it's probably two or three percent of the time, and it's usually just when I'm traveling. Like if I'm going up to LA, I'll use a quick charge station. Uh, but from my house in Carlsbad, I can get down to San Diego, I can get out to Ramona, I can get to Tustin and back without charging. So it's super convenient to charge at home. So I don't really use it. It's only if I'm going beyond that area that I'll use a, a quick charger. Yeah. Two percent, maybe three, is what I would say. Uh, the vehicles that you have have a 85 mile range, is that right? Yeah, so it, you know, if you're on the freeway at 75 miles an hour, it would be about 80 miles. And then in the city, typical mixed driving some city, some freeway, it's around 90, 95 miles. Okay, how would you do an extended trip, say up to the Bay Area? Um, so you wouldn't. Okay. Uh, you would essentially rent a car for a week, or you would fly up there, or you'd take a train or a cruise ship. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? You know, I shouldn't say you wouldn't. It's very impractical. Of course, you could do it by stopping and fast charging, but. Having no experience with an electric vehicle, I don't know how this works, but, you know, you've got a, a standard range, whatever you said, 80 miles, 100 miles, whatever. What's the indicator on the dashboard that tells you you're getting close and, yeah. and what, you know, how do you, where's the panic stage set in? Sure. So in a, as, it's actually a different type of panic because when you're in a gas car, it's like, when do I refuel my car and the little yellow light comes on and then it's like, okay, I have to get gas today or whatever. In an electric car, there's really two measurements. One is what we affectionately call the gasometer. So there'll be a, um, there'll be a, um, an algorithm that shows how many miles of driving you have left in the electric car. Um, and that algorithm doesn't really account for a lot of things, such as topography, if you're going uphill or downhill, or speed. It's just a good guess, is what I would say. The other one that drivers really, really know is the percentage of charge. So how much percentage of battery you have left is the other indication. And the driver gets to know his car and his commute and his route and what he's doing. And that's very reliable. It's just as reliable as a gas gauge. So um, the electric cars start notifying you around 15 miles and then that notification becomes a little bit more extreme around 10 miles and about five miles it's yelling at you to, to, to get into a charger. So a little bit more progressive notifications in a gas car. What happens if you fail to? What happens if you fail? Sure, so I actually have 150,000 miles driving EVs right now and I have purposefully run out of energy twice. Uh, one was a 104 mile trip, so for example, this car in this uh, in this uh, BMW i3, I did a 104 mile trip to Mount Palomar, climbing 5,400 feet, and then coming back to the house. Um, and I ended up about 400 yards short of my house and had to get towed to my house. But it was a purposeful experiment. I have yet to run out of energy uh, by accident or by error. Um, and so I think you know if you have a person who often runs out of gasoline. 
that person's probably going to often run out of uh, electricity, and the answer is the same for both. Uh, and then, but a person who's really good about it, their gasoline usage, they're going to be just fine in electric car as well. Good. We good on questions? All right. There's just a, a shorter slideshow here. So yep. if you're, I think it's uh, is it a total of 17 or 21. I can't even remember. I think it was so, in the low 20s. The low 20s. Okay. So yeah. go ahead and count to 12 if you're on a, on a slideshow. I don't think we're going to go all the way around. I think the last few aren't going to be needed over here at, at 11 and 12. So we should see number 13 come up here on number one, right? And there's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and we're right about there. Okay, good. There we go. So just a little wrap up. Uh, so this is our actual experience. So this is not like a statistical norm or an average or, you know, if you have a high uh, daytime electric rate and you're charging an electric car, it's going to be a pretty big dollar to charge that car. But if you use their time of use rates or their nighttime rates or their EV rates, it's a very low number to use that car, uh, to charge that car. So instead of a statistical average, this is our actual experience through the year, okay? So this is one person, one family's experience. Uh, we generated 13.5, our solar system 8.5K. It equals roughly just under 1,600 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of system size. That's going to become important here in a little bit. We averaged 4.2 miles per kilowatt on the cars. I averaged 4.1. My wife averaged 4.3 for the 21,477 miles. So we know how many miles we get per kilowatts. We divide that by the miles that we drove, and we get 5,600 kilowatt hours of electricity is the electricity required to drive those two I3s. Uh, that mileage. And so we also know that this is what we can get per kilowatt of system size. So a system size of 3.18 kilowatts would provide the power to drive those I3s. The cost of that system is the same price as buying gasoline for less than three years for the fleet average vehicle at 20 miles per, 25 miles per gallon. And so for example, that would be a BMW 3 Series, uh, very comparable to the I3. So the ROI when you use solar for a transportation fuel is 35%. When you use it as a utility offset, you now it varies between maybe 8% to 16 or 17%. Um, the cost, our cost of driving that, and that's simply taking a solar output for 25 years. Uh, micro inverters are warranted for 25 years. Panels are warranted for 25 years. Um, is 1.7 cents per mile. Now, the system is going to last a lot longer than 25 years. It's already eight years old. Um, and then if you use the advantageous time of use rates, we're on the EV time of use rate two, which means for six months of the year during the day, it's very expensive when we're putting electricity back into the grid and then we're charging at night, it's very cheap. Our cost of running is 1.3 cents per mile. Okay, that's just straight math on our equation. What that means for us to drive 25 miles, which is, would be a normal car on a gallon of gas, 25 miles, for us to drive 25 miles, it's about 35 cents. All right, that's a tenth of the running cost for us than uh, gasoline at $3.50 a gallon. Um, we put our solar, VP, solar PV on our house in January of 2007. 100% uh, cost recovery we had in April of 2012. So for the last three years, um, you know, it's just really no running costs for the house or for the fuel or de minimis running costs for the house of fuel. Okay, so if you don't remember anything I say tonight and you don't remember the presentation, just remember one thing, and that is solar PV is a transportation fuel. And why that's important is because most Californians and most San Diegans don't view it that way. They view solar PV as a utility offset for their house or for the building. But it's a transportation fuel, and it's even more important to use it for transportation than to use it for our buildings, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, there's the economic piece of it. It's typical ROI, typical ROI. When you use solar PV to offset, so we, we have this desire to take San Diego to 100% renewable energy. Great for our buildings uh, and our energy use. Outstanding. But the appliances inside that building or inside that house and the machines and the computers, they don't get any more efficient. They use the same amount of energy whether they're getting it from the grid or from the coal or from natural gas or from wind or solar. That refrigerator uses this, that computer uses this, that um, device dryer uses that. So there really is no inherent energy efficiency savings using solar versus any other form to power an electronic device. 
When you use it as a transportation fuel, get ready for this, there's a 400 to 500 percent efficiency gain over using petrol or gasoline to power the gasoline motor. Uh, that simply means that a gasoline car averages uh, 25 miles per gallon and for the same energy in a gallon of fuel, it's roughly 33 kilowatts, an electric car uh, like the BMW i3 is rated at 124 miles per gallon equivalent. That means it can go five times as far as a gas motor for the same amount of energy. Okay, it's that efficiency savings that solar and electricity enable in our transportation fleet that's going to create enormous wealth for either a household, and I'll get to it in a second, or for a city. The other reason, and for me it's a more important reason, that I'm very passionate about is this slide. Now this is very similar to what you saw on the earlier presenters. Uh, the state as a whole was 39% transportation. Well, it's a big state, a lot of rural area. The county of San Diego, this is from our climate action plan, that, by the way, uh, was sued successfully, but this, this uh, allocation of how we generate our emissions was never challenged. Just what we decided to do about it was challenged. 59% uh, in the county of San Diego is our transportation choices. And then if you get into an individual city that's more urban, right, less rural, so the state's very rural, and the county is somewhat rural, and then the city of Encinitas' climate action plan identifies 70% of its emissions from transportation. All right, so if the job here is to clean up our air and prevent global warming, climate change, if that's the job, our target should be 100% transportation as opposed to 100% buildings uh, and, and our residences because these two, these two slices are maybe a quarter of the pie. These two slices are maybe a quarter of the pie, but our transportation is j greater than 50%, in some case 70% of the pie in San Diego County. That's job one right there. That's the most efficient way to, to clean uh, the emissions and the air quality in San Diego County, and that's why solar is so important as a transportation fuel. I hope you understand that. <laughs> okay, so this is our life before. I drove a Volvo S60R, great car, 17 miles to the gallon. Uh, the Infiniti G35, great car, 17 miles to the gallon. Uh, we spent about uh, $5,4800 a year, 200 bucks for me, 200 bucks for my uh, white wife every month for fuel. Uh, big house, about $300 a month in utilities, um, and a very thin slice of renewable energy back in the early 2000s. Okay, this is our life now after solar PV and BMW i. Uh, we're all renewable except for this slice of natural gas, and our cost is about $245 per year. Uh, it's actually $170. This slide was made several months ago before we got to the finish line. Compared to 9000 Compared to 9000 yeah, so, you know, our, so uh, let's just say uh, there's homes out in Rancho Santa Fe and there's ours is an estate home. And to have a four or $500 a month utility bill is nothing for our area. Um, so uh, before we had a $300 a month utility bill and then our cost per car was about $200 a month, 50 bucks a week to fill up our cars. So that, that cost is gone. Uh, and then this is a new cost right now. And that's why I use the word de minimis. It's really... Nothing, you know, I support, uh, we'll hear some, some from SDG&E, I support some sort of a $10 a month charge to use the, the grid. I think the grid, if you use the grid and you produce something positive, you should get paid. And if you use from it, you should pay, right? So uh, however that balances out, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. But it, it's a very de minimis amount of money per year that you would pay. I also think it's an all, all hands on deck approach. We need to have utility solar. We need to have rooftop solar. We need to have the ability for apartment owner or condo owner or somebody who has shade to participate and buy into a solar PV. Um, all, of it, all of it needs to happen and it needs to happen as rapidly as possible. So, so if we, uh, I've, been, I've been driving for 35 years. I plan to drive another 25 years. Solar PV systems today are warranted for 25 years. The microinverters are warranted for 25 years. Um, but let's just take this kind of example. And you're driving the gas car, you're, you're powering by utilities. Um, they don't stay the same price. You know, 3.5% is a good number for annual increases. This is what it's going to cost you to drive and live in your home for 25 years. Okay. The Sun hasn't sent me a letter saying the rates are going to go up. Uh, so once you pay for your system, 
uh, and that system is providing enough energy for your home and your car, and this is what it, it basically would cost $12,000 to power our two i3s, uh, and about $18,000 for a six kilowatt system to power our house. Uh, the total is $30,000. And that's where the wealth savings come in. Now, just using the electric vehicle, the wealth savings and generations, even if you're utility powered, is still enormous. It's just a little better uh, when you're solar powered. So it, you, you can imagine this. We're um, just over one million households in San Diego County. Uh, if, 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 if this was even a tenth of what could be done on the households or the buildings, how much wealth we can create and share, share that in our community. So now I'm going to just kind of uh, try to open your mind a little bit and talk about disruptive change. And so there's safety and security in the status quo. We all know it. But there's no future. Um, there's only a past. Okay? And so what holds us back from progressing is really the status quo. We know it. We're comfortable with it. We're kind of fearful of the unknown and the change. And so really the status quo can be a foe or can be an opponent of progress. And what we need to do as community leaders and leaders is when we know something is right and we know something is good, we need to push for it. And we need to push for it hard because there's going to be resistance from the status quo. There's just no doubt about it. Um, so let's talk about some, some, some examples of disruptive change. Eastman Kodak, a great company, 130 years old, worldwide leader in photography. Um, it went bankrupt in 11 years. The SD uh, memory cards were introduced, standardized basically, in 2003. And then in 2012, the company went bankrupt. Um, very, very rapid decline because of some disruptive technology, digital camera. And we, we, we talk about uh, digital cameras today. Oh my gosh, every device that we have and our phones and everything are digital cameras now. Um, interestingly enough, Kodak patented the first digital camera. Uh, the patent was to write those analog digits, the zeros and ones, onto a cassette tape. So and that's, that's a picture of the camera, the first digital camera patented by Kodak. So unless you're taking digital pictures and writing them on a cassette tape, you're, you're not in danger of trespassing on their patent. Um, so it's still a device, though. You still have an iPhone, and you still have a memory chip, and you still have a camera. But let's talk about disruptive changes that don't even involve a device. Uh, there, there's actually nothing, uh, which is pretty remarkable to think about. Uh, if there's any native San Diegans here, you'll remember Tower Records on Sports Arena Boulevard by the sports arena. I love that place. But what's the number one seller of music in the world today? Thrift store. No. Um, Amazon. <laughs> iTunes. iTunes, number one seller. Yeah. Uh, iTunes is the number one seller of music. They don't own a music store. They don't own a record. They don't own a CD. When you buy their music, you don't get a device or a thing. Um, and yet they're the number one seller of music. Disruptive change. Okay. Number one seller of books, Amazon. Okay. Uh, so we love to load up four or five books on our iPads uh, when we go on vacation instead of stuffing four or five books into a suitcase. They don't own bookstores. They don't own books. Uh, they're the number one seller of books. Disruptive change. Number one ride for hire, Uber. Uber. Worldwide, Uber. Number one ride for hire. They don't own a car, and they're the number one ride for hire. So this is the type of disruptive change that we've seen. We're, we're, we're transitioning with that taxi picture. We're transitioning into transportation. But it's the type of disruptive change we've seen rapidly. And the change when it was Intel took 20 years. When it was Microsoft, it took 10 years. When it was Facebook, it took four years. When it was Uber, it took two years. It's happening faster and faster and faster. And this change in our energy system, change in our transportation system, is kind of the next 30 years. We've been in it for five or six years. But this is, this is coming. This is the change coming. Does anybody at Communications Revolution, uh, first two digital applications for a phone when we shifted from analog to digital? Any, any guesses? Really cool, really simple when I tell you what they are. Call waiting and caller ID. If you remember that, OK? And if you think about it today, we have millions and millions of entrepreneurs who are making money on a communications device using communications network. And before, it was just kind of the Ma Bells. Um, and that first two applications uh, in the early 80s, late 70s, of 
digital applications, caller ID and call waiting, are now, I, I, they're countless. They're, you know, they're in the billions, I'm sure, in terms of app developers. So it's a really, really cool time in our history. It's great to be alive. It's great to be uh, a professional practicing in these fields, helping car companies, helping our county move forward. Uh, and I just, I, I don't know if I have one or two more slides, but I think I'm pretty much done. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and shift to San Diego. Uh, we are a national leader in adoption for EVs and PEVs, and when we combine that with solar PV adoption, the combination of the two, we're pretty much tops in the nation. There are some cities that have more EV than we have and some cities that have more solar than we have, but the combination of the two, we're definitely number one or two in the nation. Um, we are uniquely positioned to lead this nation and this energy and transportation revolution. And I'll just throw a couple of choices at you. In the communications revolution, there were cities that said, fine, we're okay with the industrial revolution, we'll just stay right here. Uh, can you think of a city that kind of did that or said that? Uh, for me, Detroit comes to mind. They went from a million and a half people to about 800,000 people and had just severe, severe poverty. Uh, kind of stuck in the, uh, some cities said, you know what, area's great, we're gonna go after this communication revolution. Can anyone think of cities like that? Mountain View, Seattle, Palo Alto, to their great benefit, job creation, wealth, health, to their great benefit. So we have a choice in San Diego. We can just say, you know what, we're good, status quo, let's just stay here. Um, others have done that before. Or we can say, let's really grab this sucker and go for it. Let's lead. Let's get out there. We know it's coming. We know there's going to be tremendous job growth, tremendous wealth. Let's get out there and lead. I think we can do it in San Diego. We have the academic heft. We have the scientific, scientific heft heft, life sciences. We have a, a great utility in San Diego with SDG&E, uh, California Center, or the Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, we have design leadership here. Uh, we have some companies. Qualcomm is a leader in the space of going to wireless charging for electric vehicles. Leviton down in Chula Vista, a leader in the space. So we have already uh, companies in San Diego who are leading the nation. The best thing that we have here in San Diego, I think, is a resource that's going to become more and more important that we've kind of just taken for granted. And that's, we have sunshine. We have a lot of sunshine, and sunshine is really cool. So remember, solar is a transportation fuel, and we can live and drive on sunshine. And thank you. That concludes my presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That slide convinced me, right? You know, when you look at over the life of a house, the life of a car, $200,000, oh my gosh. So that was it for me. So let's, in, in deference to time and to Keith, now T Keith's gonna get into a, the, the challenges of the utility in this space as we're clearly moving in this direction. It's a challenge for the utility to accept this uptake of all of this new technology, especially EV. So go to the, the slideshow that says EVGI at the bottom. It's a, it's a shorter slide deck, so it's only gonna be two rounds on this. Um, and I'll jump into number one and three over here. So go ahead and find that set and put up your number if you would. Uh, I'll do these here. I'll, I'll let you hold them. And you saw his bio a little earlier, if you want to do a little introduction for yourself sure. as well, so they get the background for yourself. So he's also Great. driving an EV too. So every presenter tonight yeah. has an electric vehicle in their car, so you're, they're speaking from experience. I'm thrilled that you're here. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Thank you for having me. Good. Do you have an issue? Oh. Okay. Um, again, my name's Kevin O'Byrne, and I am with SDG&E, and I'm a, uh, a newly uh, EV adopter. I wouldn't say I'm an early adopter. I've just uh, had one for about six or seven months now. Um, but I think that the, the previous speakers did a great job of setting the table all about their experience and their expertise on electric vehicles, um, what's out there, what's available, the charging systems. Um, I think this, uh, this presentation will sort of complement that because what we're now talking about is, is how is the growth going uh, in the state for electric vehicles as well as charging stations. And if it does grow to the uh, level that the governor um, the governor's goals, then how is that going to affect the, the, uh, the grid, you know, as, as far as charging and how, how and when people charge? So I'd like to start with a couple um, things that are slightly off of, of uh, electric vehicles just generally, but on the second, second chart here you can see, and it was mentioned earlier that 
Um, the state's goals, first of all, were, were focused on greenhouse gas emission reductions as well as uh, renewable energy increases and meeting the state's and the governor's goals of uh, adoption of electric vehicles. So as far as renewable energy, and this does play in, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, but on slide two here, you can see that SDG&E reached 32% of our overall portfolio. All of the energy that we produce or procure came from renewable energy in 2014. Um, we're going to hit 33% this year. The state mandate is to hit 33%. All the utilities in the state need to hit 33% by the end of 2020. So we're gonna hit it five years in advance. We're actually going to be hitting 40% over these next few years. So it, it's very good. That's a, an excess and a new, uh, a new uh, source of energy that we have available to us. If you look at number three, and some of you that might have been here, uh, I know Peter mentioned that uh, Rob Anderson from our organization um, in charge of resource planning was here. And he used this chart, and I wanted to incorporate this as well, and I'll refer back to it. But what this is showing is we actually, with this great influx of renewable energy, which is primarily solar and wind, and solar, as you can see, you know, it, it happens really in the middle of the day, obviously. It, it uh, decreases to the point into the evening, and then, then obviously it's not there anymore. We have so much renewable energy now that we have in our system that as the next few years grow, and we've, we've already contracted to continue increasing above 33%, we have more and more excess generation actually in the middle of the day, which is not really uh, what you would think. You'd think that uh, you know, that's when um, we, need, we have the most load, the most need for electricity. That isn't necessarily the case in, in SDG&E's territory. We're primarily a residential-based utility. Uh, our, our, uh, our customers are mostly residential. It's driven a little bit differently than up in SoCal Edison's territory or PG&E's territory up, up north. And so our peak is driven more by the residential users. And so what you can see here um, is that our ramp really goes up well into the evening. A lot of the other utilities have peaks that are, you know, the three, four o'clock, you know, middle of the afternoon when it's, when it's hot and air conditioning is being used. In the other utilities uh, experience, they have more industrial base, so that's during the more traditional uh, work hours. But for us, a lot of people are at work, they're at school, we have plenty of generation from renewable energy, particularly solar in the middle of the day, and then everybody comes back and you see there's six o'clock. So this big ramp up starts happening and it coincides with the reduction of energy that we get from solar. And I'm talking about rooftop solar, but also even um, more specifically, utility level solar that we have um, you know, out in the Imperial Valley that we contract and it comes to the Sunrise Power Link and we have massive amounts of megawatts coming there. And so we have an abundance of energy actually in the middle of the day when the use is actually moderate, but the generation is heavy. And then as we head into the evening, as I mentioned, solar starts dissipating as the sun weakens and eventually goes down. But then everybody comes home. Everybody's coming home from school. They're coming home from work. They're turning on their stoves, their lights, their TVs, their computers. Everything's starting to ramp up. So we have a little bit of a different peak heading into the evening. It's really more like 6 to 9 o'clock. So when, when I'll come back to this when we talk about how charging can actually take advantage of this, um, this abundance. So now talking specifically about electric vehicles, the governor uh, has, has marked himself in a couple different ways. He had an executive order back in 2012 that his goals, and I'll, and I'll sort of combine slides four and five here, um, but he, uh, his goal is to have by 2020 grid integrated charging infrastructure. So this is the charges themselves they can actually integrate with the grid in order to support a million zero electric vehicles by 2020. His other goal about electric vehicles themselves is by 2025, he'd like to see 1.5 million electric vehicles on California's roadways. Um, and at, at the top is something that both Peter and Colin uh, both spoke about, but almost 40% of California's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the transportation sector. Um, in addition, the Department of Energy launched a workplace charging challenge 
to companies all across the, the nation. SDG E was the first utility in the nation to join as a partner in this. And what they, they challenged all the workplaces is to achieve a tenfold increase in the employers that are offering workplace charging within five years. And that five year point is 2018. And I'll talk a little bit specifically about what SDG E has done over the last couple years as well. And then of course, dovetailed with that is the uh, uh, renewable energy standard of raising it uh, beyond 33%. The governor back in January in his state of the state address uh, mentioned, you know, what would it look like to go to 40, maybe 50 percent. And so that's, that's something the state is looking at policy-wise, certainly something the utility is looking at as well. So slide six uh, is what's going on here in San Diego. And I won't duplicate a lot of the statistics that, that both Peter and Colin mentioned, but you, it is true. San Diego um, has a nice uh, base of electric vehicles. Um, it, it's been a nice growth. These figures are as of the end of April, so more than 16,000 electric vehicles, 890 charging stations, um, 400 all-electric car-to-go fleet. That's the sort of the loaner electric uh, car system here in San Diego. Um, and a third of those customers that have electric vehicles are on our time of use rates that Peter talked about a little bit earlier. So it's a nice growth path. Um, it looks uh, you know, very substantial, but this is the problem, and this is why sdg &E is proposing what we're proposing, is to try to help boost this. Here is a, an analysis based on the governor's goals, and this is the first one, and this is statewide, but this is on the, the electric vehicle adoption of reaching one and a half million electric vehicles on the road by 2025, and you can see this is the, the trajectory that would need to happen and even with some nice growth, and yet, yes, we're up to 135,000 electric vehicles statewide right now, but the trajectory is just not going to meet it. It, it. it looks like right now, unless there's a substantial change and all of a sudden a swooping increase, um, we're not going to even reach 40% of what the governor has, has set as a goal. Uh, same thing over here. This is uh, just sdg &E specific, and you can see that, yes, we've got a nice collection, we're up to 15,000, more than 15,000 electric vehicles in sdg &E's territory. Um, this is our share of that 1.5 million cars, and right now the trajectory is going to fall woefully short. It, it looks like it would get to about 40 percent. Um, same problem with the electric vehicle charging stations. In order to have uh, a sufficient charging station infrastructure, in order for people to adopt the electric vehicles, Right now, even with the, the network that, uh, that Peter and Colin spoke about, we've got a nice growth of uh, electric vehicle charging, but it's, it's far, far lower. And these, these different uh, ratios here, um, they're different uh, charging companies, different policymakers that believe that some of them believe that it should be a one to two ratio um, of cars to chargers. Some uh, believe one to five, one to 10. Either way, right now we're following much further down there. And one of the things that we found, and we're looking at a lot of the electric vehicle adoptions and the charging station, is it's really a perfect chicken and the egg situation. Those of you that haven't uh, stepped out yet and bought an electric vehicle, one of the big uh, findings from surveys we find is that they aren't doing so because they look at uh, the charging infrastructure. Either it's just at home or they might not be able to charge at home, and I'll talk about that solution in a moment or the charging infrastructure network just isn't robust enough yet. And so they have that fear, that range anxiety. You know, Peter mentioned uh, back when you drive a gasoline car, when you get low, gas, station, gas stations are abundant. So you can, you can take care of that issue anytime you want. When you're charging, you know, you've got to get to a charging station one way or the other. Um, and same thing the other way around. Uh, the, the commercial industry of the charging infrastructure business um, is looking at the adoption rate of electric vehicles. See, they're seeing a nice adoption rate, but it's a big investment to go expand that network and make it available, making sure that enough cars are going to take advantage of it so that it's a good economic decision for them. They are expanding at a modest rate, sort of in tune with what the EV adoption rate is. So they're really sort of a challenge there. So what sdg &E, uh, proposed in 2014, and this is a proceeding that's in front of the Public Utilities Commission. It hasn't been approved yet, but this is to integrate two different things. It's, it's to help 
spur and increase the adoption of EVs um, by making the charging infrastructure more available to customers. Um, and at the same time, integrate it in the right way into the, the grid. Because let's say that we did reach these very lofty and, and great goals. We'd all love to see that happen, but we can't have everybody come and charge at the wrong time. I'm gonna step back to the, the duck chart. That's why this is called a duck belly chart. We've got an abundance of energy in the middle of the day. If everybody comes home, these are residents, they're off to work, they come home with their car, they plug in at six o'clock, that's the worst thing that, that the grid can take. You know, we don't want all of this load occurring at the wrong time. And so we, this, this is a way to incent customers to charge at the right time, which is, is something that all the cars have the ability to do. And so these are the two, um, as far as electric vehicles, uh, things that we'd like to see, just more electric vehicles. You know, get it back on the trajectory to meet the, the state's goals and also more zero emission miles driven per electric vehicle. So especially Colin talked about not just the all electric that a lot of them have 80, 90, 100 mile ranges, um, but these uh, plug-in hybrids that have a gasoline tank and a battery. Most of the batteries from what I've been reading, they're, they're fairly limited. It's something like 20, 25 miles on just the battery, but then you have the extended, you, you kick in and you're using the gas tank. If you don't have the ability to charge again at work, and let's say you have a modest, you know, somewhere in the 20 mile uh, uh, commute, then basically you're using up your battery capacity to get to work, you're done, and then you're driving home on gas. Um, and so you can basically double this if you have the ability to charge at work as well as at home. So it, that's, that's another key that we're looking for. So what we filed is something called an electric vehicle grid integration. So it's, it's, it's integrating this additional load into the grid efficiently, making it uh, uh, available to people, but also making sure that it, uh, uh, again, that the, the charging doesn't further exacerbate problems and, and make it so that we have to build new power plants, more transmission lines, just to continue to build to that, that amount. One of the things we find is charging, and Colin mentioned that uh, most people charge at home, that's absolutely true. The other place, if it's available, is at work. So any place that your car spends a long time duration of park, then, then that's where it's gonna be. And I'm similar to Peter, I've only had my car for six months, but I have not used a commercial uh, charging station because I can charge at home and I can charge at work. And those two avenues fit perfectly because my car you know, sits in the garage all night and then it sits at work, you know, all day. And so, you know, accessibility, waiting around for anything to get charged isn't necessary. So this is what we're trying to do is we've proposed to uh, build 550 facilities. These are 550 different locations at workplaces and multifamily dwellings. So this doesn't address single family homes. Most people have the ability just like what Colin mentioned, if you can plug into your normal 110 outlet, usually in your garage, then you're fine. Or you can upgrade to 220. Um, but these are for multifamily dwellings, which often, first of all, about 50% of the residents in San Diego live in multifamily dwellings. And very often they don't have accessibility. They either don't have a garage, depending on the setup of the, the, uh, the structure, they don't have a garage or they have a parking space that isn't convenient to it. So these are two big areas is to put uh, charging stations at multifamily dwellings and at workplaces. At SDG&E, we just finished an expansion over the last year. We now have more than 100 charging stations at the Kearney Mesa site alone. That's where primarily sdg and &E is, is headquartered. We have uh, over 170 employees that have electric vehicles. And so, you know, it, it's, it's available to everybody to be able to charge there at work. We pay for it, and, and I'll talk about that in a moment as well. What this does is it introduces, so this is a little different uh, than the time of use rates, and I want to talk about that as well, because both the time of use rates and this VGI, vehicle to grid integration rate, are trying to incent people by s sending them the right price signals so that they make the right decision of when to charge based on getting the correct uh, price signal. And so we're introducing an hourly rate uh, for the EV charging. Um, 
and it's different by hour, and in the next set of slides you'll see an example of this, but this is what we have at, at work, and so it's, it's a different hourly charge during the day. And the, the charge is very modest in the middle of the day when the uh, capacity of, of how much energy we have in our system, as well as it's based on individual circuits. So depending on how, uh, how fulfilled that circuit is, uh, based on all of the energy use, then, uh, then that affects the, the price as well. But it starts going up as it starts heading into the evening hours um, because we have less energy available to us and, uh, and, and, so, and we don't have the, uh, the solar in the middle of the day. Um, the way this would work, uh, the way we proposed it, is this EV charging would be billed directly into a driver's SDG&E bill. So they'd, uh, let's say we're talking about a multifamily uh, dwelling. Um, the, the host, the, the owner of the complex would say, great, you know, come in, install these, make it available to, um, we'd own the, the infrastructure end to end, and then the, uh, the residents would charge and it would get added directly onto their SDG&E bill. Um, where we're at with this right now, just last week, we had a settlement agreement. We've had a lot of different parties from um, environmental groups to uh, charging infrastructure, commercial comp companies, uh, car dealers, um, Center for Sustainable Energy, um, a number of them. So last week, they, uh, a number of the parties, including SDG&E, 17 different parties came together on a settlement agreement of terms of what this would look like. Um, this is a five-year program to install all 550 of those uh, facilities. And again, those are 550 different sites. At each site, there would be 10 charging stations. Um, so that just got filed last week with the PUC. It's an open proceeding, so that doesn't guarantee it's going to get improved, approved. But what this does is it gives the, the commission and the judge an idea that all the parties have come together and agreed on an awful lot of the terms and said, this is a settlement agreement we could all live with. And uh, we anticipate a decision on this by the end of the year. So, so given the yeah. of time, why don't we go yeah. to the He has five more slides. Right. So if you go to 13, so there's just five more slides total. Right. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So 13 will be Perfect. on one, 14 on two. And we'll let Keith continue, and then we'll have a, a round of questions. Okay? Sounds perfect. Okay, so here are a number of the benefits, and uh, obviously reducing air emissions is something that we've talked about uh, a lot today. A number of the other speakers spoke about this as well. Um, it reduces the on-peak charging, and again, going to the time of use rates, for example. Uh, this is a little different than this VGI rate, but what we're doing, this is similar to the old phone systems. If you remember the, the calling plans that um, those of you that are old enough to have the calling plans that it used to charge you a lot more to make a call in the, during the day, 8 to 5, remember? But if you made a call, if you waited and made a call in the evening, it was a little cheaper. If you made it in the middle of the night or on weekends, it was cheapest. That's what our time of re use rates are doing is it's sending signals just like that. It's saying in the middle of the day when, uh, when you know, our energy is abundant, then it, it can be reasonable. Um, as we head towards the peak, then, you know, late afternoon into the evening, that's our on-peak period. It's more expensive, it, most expensive, so we don't want you to charge your cars uh, during that time. Later in the evening, earlier in the morning um, is, is the off-peak period. It's a, it's a little cheaper than that. And then in the middle of the night, from midnight to 5, it's super off-peak, and it's the cheapest. And what it incents electric vehicle users, it, it, it works out perfectly because their cars are basically asleep in the garage. They're, they're rarely being used at that time. It's an easy time to charge. We also have an abundance of energy at that time because the load is so low. The usage is, is low. We don't have a lot of demands on the system. And so we've, but we still have an abundance of energy, so we charge the cheapest. And so what we're doing is sending those signals to time of use customers to look at it, see this diff different pricing based on the different times, come home and don't plug in immediately and charge at six o'clock. But most, if not all cars, I think Colin might know better than me, have a timer, the LEAF does that I drive, um, has a timer, you set it, and you have it start charging at midnight. So you can plug it in when you get home. You can go to bed at whatever time you want. You don't have to stay up until midnight. But then the timer starts, and you charge just during that super off peak period. 
So we're trying to send that signal. If you charge at six o'clock, that's the worst time. That's, that's our system peak. That's not the ideal time. It costs us the most money, and we have to build the infrastructure to meet the peak, wherever that peak ends up being, in power plants uh, and uh, transmission lines in order to meet that. Um, a number of these other benefits are going towards increasing the sales. We don't want the market to stall. We want to meet all these uh, zero emission uh, goals that the state has, as well as, um, in, in general, dropping down the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this educates customers about dynamic pricing, this, these, the idea about these different rates, because right now SDG&E and most of the utilities have time of use rates for electric vehicles. They don't necessarily have those yet for the general public. You all see that, those of you that aren't EV drivers yet, um, we'll see time of use rates introduced later this year, early next year, and it'll be an option for anybody. They can, you can stay on the tiered system that we have right now, or you can look at time of use and, and say, I think that that works well for me, and it, it's basically a financial uh, question for you. Very quickly, these next three slides are just to give you an idea on what it looks like. This vehicle-to-grid integration rate is something that's been a prototype at SDG&E over the last couple years, and this is similar to what it would look like if this gets introduced out to workplaces and multi-unit dwellings. And it, you can do this on your app. Um, basically, I've got this on my phone, or you can do it uh, on your, on your uh, computer itself. But this SDG EV, you go to this, and the nice thing here is you can set the profile. And there are three primary um, identifiers. So it doesn't mean if you go to work and you plug in that it, and it's just going to charge for eight hours while you're at work and you're going to get some cheap hours. You're going to get, you know, higher priced hours late in the afternoon. You can set your parameters. And so here's an example. You say, I don't want to get charged if it's anything more than 19 cents a kilowatt hour and whatever your departure time is and how many kilowatt hours you need. And then on the right side of this, you can see here are some sample uh, uh, prices by the hour. And again, this is based on two things. It's the Cal ISO, the, the independent system operators, day ahead price built in with SDG&E's price that takes into account the circuit um, congestion and, and the cost on the, the circuit itself. So this could be different anywhere. This is the Century Park up in Kearney Mesa circuit as a basis for this. And so you can see these prices change by hour. Um, this is back in April, so these are technically winter months. And so there isn't a big gap as we start heading into the, we're now technically, technically in summer months. As we get into July and August and September, our hotter months, then there are going to be a lot of these that are going to be a little higher on an hourly basis. But you can see an example here that even in the middle of the day that I was talking about with the abundance of energy, 17, 17, then 18, 18 into the early to mid-afternoon, as we start getting to the late afternoon, 19, 20. That's as solar starts dissipating off of the system, the strength and um, often off the system, especially during the winter months. And also, it's as uh, people start using a lot more. So you set those parameters. So I'll get to work and I'll plug in, and my parameters are set. You don't have, you can toy with it as much as you want, but you set it and you basically just plug it in. And I'll walk from one building to another and I'll glance at my car and I'll see that it's not charging. And it means that my parameter, uh, it's over whatever the limit that I set. And we have these keypads, and we'd make these available as well. So those people that didn't want to use an app on their phone or go to their, you know, their, their laptop or their uh, desktop computer, this is basically what we have. You go, we have those 100, 100 uh, charging stations. You go over and you plug in whatever your station is that you pulled in and plugged into, and then your, key, your PIN number that you set up for an account, and then you're off and running. And, and then you just leave it. And so, again, that... You know, it, it overcomes, there was a lot of discussion here about, you know, why to buy an EV. Um, this overcomes one of those big obstacles is those people that have, and they call it anxiety, uh, you know, range anxiety. You know, am I going to be able to get to that next charge? And if you have a single family home, you probably have the ability to charge there. But if you live in a multifamily dwelling and don't, and if your workplace doesn't have it, then you're very unlikely to 
to uh, buy an electric vehicle. And we're not going to hit these. If 50% if of SDG&E's customers live in multifamily dwellings, we're not going hit, to hit these lofty goals that the state has. Nope. That's it. Very nice. All right, let's give them a big hand. So challenges for the utility to meet these targets, but clearly I think that the, our utility is, is leading the charge on this. I, I want to include Colin and Peter to come up. Let's catch some final round of questions, and if you want to focus on any or, or keep them specific, let's do that because I, I know they Make all sure have a chance. Questions for, uh, questions for any of them? Make sure your mic is on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got lots and lots of questions, but uh, I, don't, I don't think we have enough time to go into most of them. <laughs> but a very simple one, on your 33%, uh, Yes. Uh, does that include residential rooftop solar? It doesn't. Uh, and this is set up by the state's renewable portfolio standard. They set up all the rules and, and basically said, no, it, it doesn't apply to that. So this is just utility scale um, energy. So we have the rooftop solar on top of that. Um, that is being generated, but it doesn't count in the 33% um, mandate. And I know last time we heard that there is a change in the policy when we have solar rooftop hitting 5% penetration, which is within... Yeah, so you're, you're referring to net energy metering increase? Yes. We're actually yeah. on our second one. Our first one on you have to utilities and the regulators are on the second net energy metering agreement. The first one expired um, when the usage hit 2%. Um, then there was a series of negotiations, and it ended up at 5%. So as we reach 5% of energy use uh, with this um, solar, with solar the net rooftop. energy, solar rooftop, um, then we'll, we'll get into a net energy metering agreement number three, I'm sure. Um, what that looks like, um, we don't know. But I think on the user side, the users are anticipating, um, as we have more and more of it, you know, the, the benefits, if you will, or the subsidies that were there early in net energy metering one, um, a little bit less in net energy metering two, and net energy metering three, probably a little bit less. But what it does is, I, I believe it's a 20-year agreement for the owner of the system. It essentially allows them to have, uh, you know, the, so, the, so the game doesn't change two years after they spend twenty or $30,000 for a solar PV system. It gives them some assurance that they're going to have this agreement in place for 20 years. Exactly, if I can build upon that. So that's a 20 year grandfathering. So the NEM rules, the net energy metering rules are specific to the customers that have net energy metering and actually will have it, they get it installed anytime until we hit that cap. And all that cap means is that anybody that gets it through that time, they're, they're grandfathered under those previous rules, the previous structure of net energy metering rules for 20 years from the date that they installed it. So that could have been 10 years ago, that could have been yesterday, it might be next month, grandfathered for 20 years. And, and we support this, as, as Peter said, it, it's so that people that made an economic decision, maybe spent 20,000, 25,000 on a rooftop solar system, they don't have the rules all of a sudden shifted on them you know, a month later or two years later. And then the commission is, by law, the commission has been designated, this is California Public Utilities Commission, has been designated to come up with whatever those new rules beyond that cap sometime next year, maybe into uh, close to 2017, of what those new rules would look like. And we just don't know what they're going to come out. All the parties are involved in saying, you know, we think it should look like this, and, and we'll see what that structure looks like. Uh, I'm Andy Hamilton with the Air Pollution Control District in San Diego, and I've been asking this question all over town, which is, we have grant money that we can provide incentives to do something to boost this EV picture. What is your opinion about where we should aim our uh, grants, our incentives? I was going to say you. I mean, what, what we're using is, uh, is doesn't need uh, grant funding. Um, this is something that, uh, that all ratepayers, because they'll all benefit from it, um, uh, including the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, um, so this is something that would be socialized amongst all customers. So um, we wouldn't need funding for something like that. If it's something else to spur the, uh, the, the growth and adoption of uh, electric vehicles, it might be a different organization. Andy, for, for, for your money, um, I would highly recommend that you focus on the transportation sector, obviously, uh, since that's the source of most of the emissions. And I think a good place to start really is kind of uh, perhaps multifamily um, 
uh, there, yeah, and maybe some lower socioeconomic uh, because the cars are expensive, and you know if you're an early adopter and you have the ability to do it, um, it, it kind of you, to go out and buy a you know $125,000 Tesla and get a $2,500 state rebate kind of you know irks me a little bit. So I think maybe have it focused towards multifamily housing. And if I can, I'm sorry to keep adding things here, but uh, also our program and part of the settlement agreement was that at least 10% of all of the sites that are adopted by this program, if it is approved by the commission, would be in uh, you know, underdeveloped, disadvantaged communities. And so that's, that's the idea, is to focus on a lot of those areas where, where people might not necessarily be able to uh, adopt an electric vehicle, even if they think it's a good idea, but we're going to focus on those areas as well. Other questions? Uh, first of all, great presentation from all of you. I really appreciate your sharing your wisdom. Um, this question is for Kevin. Yeah. Could you briefly walk through the process um, of installing the 550 facilities? Obviously, they won't be on your property. They'd be spread out on all these properties. Correct. If you just briefly step through the land acquisition, the permitting, the infrastructure, who's responsible for maintenance, and how that plays out yeah. for, for each one. I'll, I'll do that on a, on a high level, and that's a lot of what we're working on now. And again, I, I want to caution everyone, this isn't an approved program yet. Um, with the settlement agreement, it, again, it means that 17 different parties got together and came to an agreement on a, on a package of terms. But it's not there yet, and we, if we get approval, it'll be in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, but I can say that what we're going to do, again, th this isn't on SDG&E's property. This would be at private businesses and privately owned multifamily dwellings. And so we would be reaching out to a lot of those businesses and um, through the apartment associations and through a lot of those trade groups and reaching out to them and saying, this is something that we'd like to offer and find out what the interests. And there's going to be a request for interest uh, type process of, of some sort. Um, as far as uh, owning, we would own the infrastructure all the way through because this would be ratepayer owned assets. And so it's important for us to own it all the way through. As far as operating and maintenance, we're responsible for it. A lot of these are going to get installed by the same companies that do this out in the private world as well, the, the uh, charging infrastructure businesses that are out there already. They have the expertise in doing that. We have the expertise in, in the electrical cabling and all of that and the trenching. But as far as the charging stations themselves, we would uh, uh, contract with a number of different one, uh, organizations, not just one, that would be involved in that. And in that agreement, um, we'd be responsible overall for the operations and maintenance of this equipment, but we would contract with them and say this is a service agreement between SDG&E and whoever the company is. But the, the other part of your question, you know, as far as site acquisition and land use and all of those land rights, it's going to be unique to 550 different sites, I imagine. I mean, a lot of them will look the same, but a lot of them are going to have their unique, just like citing anything that the utility does, there are always unique uh, circumstances of ownership and land use and environmental issues and, and so forth. Can I tag on to yep. that real quick? Just, um, just to tag on to that, and the, the EV chargers that are out there, they're, they're at various levels of maintenance. Uh, I'll just say that. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating for an EV driver to pull up and the charger is out and it's been out for three months and we've had some networks here in San Diego County that have kind of failed and then tried to get started again. And EV drivers, I, I just can tell you, I mean, so high confidence having SDG&E taking care of owning and maintaining EV charging infrastructure. That would be a blessing uh, compared to some of the infrastructure that we see out there right now. I, I think my question is for more for Peter. Uh, it, it seems in this, uh, well, incidentally, I want to echo the comment how much I appreciate the presentation from all of you. It's really informative. But, it, you know, the, the car manufacturers have a, a silo, a piece of this element. The utilities have a piece of it. Uh, and the government is issuing, you know, declarations. What They have a piece. Who's, who's providing the coordination for this? In other words, um, you know, it, are, is the county uh, doing things in terms of... Um, 
whether it's social media, you know, the uh, electricvehicleowners.com or uh, new codes, that, like a yeah. new construction. Are we ensuring that there's uh, the ability to put chargers in everybody's garage? Are you, uh, you know, park and ride? Are you, you know, I, I just don't know. But is there a way to make this smoother? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a system. Uh, it's like anything else. There's a lot of players in that system. Um, so, you know, in, in just in county land use, we have governance and then we have lawyers and we have courts and we have, uh, you know, pressure groups, if you will, or groups that disagree with a decision and, and they all play an important role. And so in this kind of transportation system that we have, um, you know, I think the leadership comes from the state. Uh, we have the uh, California uh, Energy Commission. Uh, they give a lot of grant money out to counties and to cities uh, and to companies to install infrastructure to help this go forward. We have the utilities. Uh, we have the car companies. Uh, BMW and Bosch are putting level three chargers out in the, in the field. Nissan was very, very proactive of putting chargers out in the field. So they have a big role to play with that. Education is a huge role. Um, and then, you know, administering grant programs. So there's... Um, we, we are somewhat siloed, but you'd be surprised at how much coordination there is with car companies and utilities, with charging infrastructure and car companies, with governments. Uh, we, we, like anything, we have our conferences uh, regionally, uh, statewide, what's going on, and we see a best case and say, you know what, that's really cool, let's, let's try and do something like that. So um, I'm, I'm generally happy with the level of cooperation that's going on. Uh, it can always be better. Um, but we all have a role to play, and I think the most important thing is we all want to get there, uh, and it's you know not one silver bullet, and um, and you know we we're partners in that. Any other final questions? Tom? Last one. Yeah, last one. This is this is a quick one. When you uh, get the EVs all set up, we're all going to turn on at midnight and charge at the lower rates, or you're going to give right. them this price point. When are you going to start having? grid stability problems because everybody does it at once. Not at that time, but it, either way, it would be on a circuit by circuit basis. I mean, we, SDG&E is monitoring on an ongoing basis all more than 1,100 circuits that we have in our system. Some of them, their capacity is very low. It's not a concern. We have some, we have a capital budget that identifies which ones are starting to get to an increased amount. And it's not just electric vehicles. We have to remember what's been added in the last few years with you know, computers and high definition TVs. I mean, the, all of these things have been added on top for a number of years and those just all build up into what ends up being the circuit capacity. And as we start seeing circuits that start getting built up, that's when we start doing upgrades or filling in uh, whatever we need to do to strengthen that. So the same thing would happen with electric vehicles. Of course, they're gonna get spread out all over the place, um, but if, if we have thousands of electric vehicles, they're gonna be spread over our 1,100 circuits. But we monitor all those circuits and on an annual basis add more and more, whatever are up near the top that are beginning to um, you know, look like a concern, those are the ones that are focused on and our capital budget takes care of those going forward. Again. Again, I think another graduate course on, on this topic that you couldn't get a better set of presenters and I, I really want to thank Peter, Colin and, and Keith. Just outstanding. All of these presentations will be on our website within a couple of days, so you won't lose it if you want to go re review it all. Uh, the slides, the, excuse me, the video as well will be up on our YouTube channel. So that usually takes just a few minutes with Michael back there. Thank Michael Russell for doing that work. He does phenomenal work. This is a this is a little sound studio and, and a, a AV studio going on. If you hadn't known, this will go up. Uh, uh, it's actually not been going out live, but we do push it out on UStream, so you will have that uh, as a as a um, I think it's a, a something that will live on from this presentation tonight. Just a little bit of a, a couple of announcements. Colin has brought in Plug Into the Sun, which is a, the, their initiative uh, from Center for Sustainable Energy. So you can pick up that sheet right here. I know I went to SDG&E's site just uh, last month, and they have a, a, a whole a page there or several pages on electric vehicles and time of use rates. Okay. So a whole section on the, on the electric vehicle uh, option for SDG&E. Next week, I just want to make a pitch for our presentation for the Green Scene Evening, we are having Stephen Heverly come back in. He, this is 
he, he runs the Equinox Center. He's one of our partners here for this, this initiative for 100% Renewable. They publish the Quality of Life Dashboard every year. This is last year's dashboard. So they put out a Quality of Life Dashboard for San Diego every year. They'll be launching that or showing that 2015 dashboard next, I think it's next Wednesday, isn't it, Paul Michael? So come back next Wednesday and see how 15 different indicators are going, which include CO2 emissions, beach closures, any number of issues around our quality of life here in San Diego. Some things are thumbs up and th some things are thumbs down. If you'd like to join and actually come for free for these, some of you have done that. Uh, if you become a member, you can come here for free for all our presentations. If not, you got to pay 10 or 15 bucks at the door. And with that, I really want to thank you all for coming tonight. You guys are great. Thank very you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Great job. Very nice. Good job. Nice to meet you too. That was terrific. You convinced me. <laughs> Colin, thank you. Thank you. Keith. Great, thank you. Kevin. I, I said Keith. I am so Don't sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I am so You're sorry. You're quite welcome. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you. Have one perfect.